In Titus chapter 2 this evening, our text tonight is going to be from verse 5. And the title of our message this evening is Keepers at Home. Notice with me as we read from verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men may be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husband, that the Word of God be not blasphemed. Heavenly Father, tonight we ask that Thy will to be done. Lord, help us as we consider this subject this evening. And Lord, help us with the Scriptures as we turn to them and read them. Lord, that that would be attentive to what You have said to us. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we preached a message for Mother's Day titled, Honoring Mothers. And this evening, I want to preach a message titled, Keepers at Home. Now, we have several articles that we have uh, written on this subject. Just a few of those is in 1996. I wrote an article titled, Keepers at Home. I'm not using that outline this evening, but I'm using some of the same scriptures. We also have an article that we never preached a message on titled, Working Women, 2007. Then, two years ago, or either one year ago, I can't remember which, 216 or 217, we preached a message titled, Domestic Duties. And we wrote an article on that subject in 2007. And also daycare. I'm going to be quoting from some of these tonight. Daycare 2010. Now actually the articles I'm going to quote from this evening will be Keepers at Home, Working Women, and Daycares. That will be the main three that we'll be quoting from tonight. When you address a subject like this in our society in America, you feel like an alien, even among a Christian people. I've said many times that uh, to prove that I'm for women, I'm not against women, I'm married to one. That ought to say something. I am also a defender of biblical motherhood as I preach this morning. I am also an advocate for mothers' or women's rights. I'll just say women's rights. I think you have a right to be a homemaker. I think you have a right to bear children. I think you have a right to be supported and protected by a man, either a father or or a husband. A young lady in the home, uh, she is under the care of her father as long as she's in that home, and she has the right to be protected and to be supported. And once a young woman gets married, she has the right to be again protected and supported by her husband. He is called the provider, and he is, and he is called the provider. Rather, she's called the helpmate. The world is enslaving women in politics, in business, in sports, in military, and also in our time in ministry. And I know that there's some women that have no choice. I know there's single mothers out there where a man has walked off and left them. I know there's widows. We read the story of Ruth and Naomi. Neither one of them had a brother or a, or a husband, you know, to help them. And we see that Ruth... Uh, went to the fields and began trying to provide some food for her and her mother-in-law. 
But even if a woman has to do that, I do not believe that a woman should seek a man's job in any way. And not only that, most women in America, they have the church, if they belong to one, that can help under circumstances, and they should have family that also can help them if problems come that are unavoidable. Now, you notice in verse 5, I'm taking my text from this verse, and in this verse, speaking to young women, it says, keepers at home. Keepers at home. That's again, that's the title of an article in 2000, or I'm sorry, 1996. That's been a while ago. And uh, we see here that uh, in this text, there's several things that we're going to look at from this. We're going to go here. We're going to look in um, Proverbs again. We're going to look in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Those are going to be some of the main passages that we're going to look at. People today say, I cannot live off of one income in a family. And I have read some articles. I know that it's difficult with some. And I've read some articles. I don't totally understand this, but uh, I've read articles where some have tried to prove that our economy, they purposely have tried to build it around two-income family. But we do know, and we've proven this over the years, that a family can live off of one income if they set their hearts to it and seek God. My wife and I have lived off of one income for over 40 years. And at times that income has not been uh, very large. I've had people say to me, you know, I hadn't had a raise in the last year and it's difficult and uh, hadn't had an increase in salary. I hadn't had one in 20 years. But God has supplied every need and many of our wants. So if we can do it, and the limited income we've had, I believe that anyone else can do it as well. Can I get an amen? It can be done. Now let me, let me go over just a few things, and I won't keep you too long tonight, but I want to... Again, read some of the main Scriptures. There's many others that we'll not get to tonight, but I want to focus on Titus, 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy chapter 5. We may read 2 Timothy chapter 1 again as we did this morning. We may read Proverbs, but just focus on some of those that that directly address this subject. There was a woman. There's a run-in mate for John Cain. In 2008, running uh, uh, for vice president, and as uh, Sarah Palin, and all the conservatives and the Republicans and the Christians got excited about this. But she made a statement on Fox News. I believe this is 2010, if I'm not mistaken. You know, she was a governor from. Alaska, before she became running mate uh, for, for vice president. And she called those who believe mothers should stay at home with their children, Neanderthals. She has much more to say here in this article I have, but she calls them Neanderthals. And then this is the same mother that left her children many times, but she also sat in the audience and clapped for her daughter, half naked, dancing with the stars. And I call that the spirit of Jezebel. I don't care if she professes Christ, she is blaspheming the Holy Scripture even until this very day. She gets back in the public's eye from time to time. She was back in it again uh, in the last two or three weeks, and that's what brought this to mind to look up this quote again that I used a number of years ago. This is an article, uh, and it says, During World War II, women entered the workforce in great numbers because so many men were fighting overseas. 
This phenomenon had begun in World War I, but it exploded in World War II when the war ended, the trend toward working moms did not stop. By the way, in my opinion, another consequence is a consequence rather of the wickedness of war. Lenin said, No nation can be free when half the population is enslaved in the kitchen. He said that in 1920s. In 1938, 78% of Americans, American people, agreed that if a woman has a husband capable of supporting her, she should not work for pay. By 1978, that number had dropped from 78 to 26. And I'm not sure what it would be in 2018. It'd probably be 10% or less. Now, I wrote this article, Keepers at Home, 1996, and I'm quoting from it, and I'm quoting from uh, some uh, two different articles, one taken from the local paper in 1996, and it said, according to r- recent U.S. Census statistics, women in record numbers are foregoing childbearing, choosing personal freedom and careers to fulfill their lives. It's 1996. I was in a doctor's office in Biloxi in 1995. And I seen a magazine laying there and I picked it up and I got my pad and paper. I always got a Bible with me and some notebook paper. And I wrote this article out of this. I didn't want to steal it. I didn't want to tear it out of the magazine. That's wrong. But I wanted the article so I copied it. And here's what he said. This is now, this is an article that I got in 1996, but it was written in 1995. And it says, Please consider the following article taken from the AFA Journal, 1995. By the year 2000, it is estimated... Now think about how far we are beyond the year 2000. By the year 2000, it is estimated that three out of four children will have mothers who work outside the home. Between 1981 and 1991, the percentage of women who went back to work before the baby's first birthday, leaped 60% to represent more than half of all new mothers. In 1976, 19% of births were to women uh, in their 30s. By 1991, that number rose to 33%. Because women in their 30s are more likely to have careers, there has been a dramatic increase in the need for daily long-term child care currently Now, this is 1995. Currently, 5.7 million children ages 3 to 5 receive care and education from people other than their parents. The Council of Chief State School Officers report that 10 million preschool children need child care, while an additional 13 million school children need after-school care. All of this is because of working Mothers working outside the home. This is in our article on the back, the article titled Working Mothers, written 2007. Since 1970s, women have surged past men both in terms of college enrollment and in degrees rewarded. Women now earn the majority of associates, bachelors, and master's degrees. This is a long time ago. This was taken out of the Mobile Register um, April the 14th, 2007. 80%, 86% rather, of women surveyed in 2007 said that they wanted to be a stay-at-home mom if they could afford it. Down deep inside, we know what's right. But the devil has robbed this from us. In 1950, 70% of households in America consisted of a full-time working father, a stay-at-home mother, and one or more school-aged children. In 1979, this was only true in 14% of the homes. That's a very short time from it to go from 70% to 14%. 
60% of children today, now again, this is 2007, this is 11 years ago, 60% of children live in a single parent home. Daycare centers are one of the fastest growing industries in America. In 1960, they were 150,000. And today, again, this is 2007, I believe. Today, it is over 2 million. And, and today, many churches are providing this service. Sizes of families are smaller today. In the 1950s, the average family was four children in the home. And today, it is less than two. It's two or less, I should say. The average age of getting married in the 1960s was 21. And in 2007, the age was 26. Three out of four children, now this is 2007, three out of four children have a mother who works outside the home. I'll skip the percentage that, uh, that represent what they represent in college students, law, law students, medical students, and top management jobs. There was a White House project a number of years ago and their whole goal by 2008 is to get a woman in as president. We preached on daycares 2010, wrote an article. And daycare is the fastest growing industry in America. And I wrote this eight, eight years ago. In the 1960, there were 150 daycares. Today, there are over 2 million. About 63% of young children in the United States are in a child care facility. That is three out of five young children. This amounts to less than one half of families with young children who have parents staying home. In 25 years, the number of moms in the workforce have nearly doubled. An estimated 12 million Americans American infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, more than half of the children in this age group attend daycare. The majority of these kids spend close to 40 hours per week in daycare. Many start when they're only weeks old. According to studies, two-thirds of all American women are working by the time their first child is a year old, compared to only 17% four decades ago. Between 1975 and 1993, the percentage of children under the age six with employed mothers rose from 33% to 55%, and by the year 2000, it was 70%. Working mothers now bring home half or more the income. This is written eight years ago. All of these statistics will change within that many years. Let me read one other quote from the, this on daycare written eight years ago, and it says, I put on the back of this some of the problems with infections and sickness and, and all of this kind of stuff, but one thing, a quote on depression. Depression is a common response to separation. A study in 2003 by an Australian baby uh, physician, Howard Clinton, showed how monkeys became distressed when separated from their mothers. When reunited, the babies became extremely clingy. If their mothers looked like uh, she might leave, they throw a tantrum and become angry and agitated. Months later, they are still anxious, will not explore like uh, the other monkeys, seem depressed and are timid about changes in their cages. Study on monkeys. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah chapter 5 and in verse 20. Now what we are addressing tonight, most preachers cannot stand in the pulpit and preach this tonight because their wives are working outside the home. I heard a preacher about five years ago told me and another preacher, he bragged about all of his families in his church were two-income families. He thought it was wonderful that all 
the mothers were working outside the home and the fathers, and the church was receiving more money, and the children are put in the public school system. Well, after bragging, about a year later, they fired him. It wasn't over that, but they, they fired him. But most preachers cannot talk about this. They cannot address it. Now notice, as we come here to our text, he says here in verse 1, coming back to verse 1, notice that what we're looking at tonight is sound doctrine. That doctrine which is wholesome and that doctrine which is healthy. He says here, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men, now we're focusing in on tonight, keepers at home. So I'm kind of avoiding talking about aged men and young men because in a few weeks to come we'll talk about that. So bear with me. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. That the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, notice verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. When he says that the aged women are to be teaching, he's not talking about behind a pulpit preaching and teaching or radio ministries and television ministries. He's just talking about them being available to help the younger women in these areas. Now, notice that as we come back to, well, verse 4, that they'd love their husbands, love their children. And then he said in verse 5 to be discreet. Now we're not, we're covering one thing tonight, keepers at home. We'll look at these other things at another time. But he says in verse 5, he said to be discreet, keepers, chaste, rather keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Notice before we get to the subject keepers at home, notice he said that the word of God be not blasphemed. So we can not only blaspheme, that is to speak against, that's what the word means, we can not only blaspheme the, the, uh, the Word of God by our words, what we speak, but we can also do it by our actions. By our actions. If we fail to be keepers at home, we're blaspheming the Word of God. And I'm not here tonight to criticize anyone that would listen to this sermon. I'm here to just bring some truth together and say, look here, please consider this. I've had women come to me and say, well, I've failed in this. I said, well, let's start now. I said, I've failed in a, in a number of things, but it's not too late. It's not too late to repent of it and to teach others. I mean, I, you know some things I've failed in, and it's never too late no matter what we failed in. But here's the thing. The word blaspheme means to speak against. So those who will not be keepers at home, they're blaspheming the Word of God. By their actions, they're speaking against the Word of God. I don't know any other way to put that. Notice back in, in, in this, uh, well, verse 10. Let's read one other verse here. He says in verse 10, the latter part of that verse, he's dealing with young men and servants here. He says, adorn the doctrine of God. Adorn the doctrine of God. In other words, uh, the word adorn means to make beautiful. Godliness is always beautiful. And we are to cherish the doctrine of God. And the doctrines of God in this passage are called sound doctrine for aged men and aged women. And he addresses uh, young women and young men and servants all in this chapter. Now notice with me as we come back to verse 5. Notice in verse 5. Notice this expression, keepers at home. 
Now, you can ask people, what does this mean? And you can run to other translations, and you can get a variety of thoughts, but it basically means to be a homemaker. In the Greek, it means to be keepers at home. In the English, it means to be keepers at home. It means to be a worker at home. It's not a matter as if a woman should work, where should she work? And whose authority should she be under? We're not, we're not for idle women. Women are not to be lazy any more than men. But it's the question is where and who for. And so this means to be a guardian of the home. To attend to the matters of the home. This is an appeal to make home top priority and it's a condemnation to idleness. So now look at the phrase, keepers at home. This phrase is translated, these three words, keepers at home, is translated from one Greek word which means housekeeper. Here's the Greek word. O-I-K-O-U-R-O-U-S. You say, well, that means a whole lot to me. Well, this Greek word is derived from two Greek words. One, O-I-K-O-S, meaning house or dwelling. And O-U-R-O-S means guard. This word means housekeeper. To be a worker at home, to be a lover of the home, and if not, the word of God is blasphemed. Notice back in chapter 1, verse 16, it says they profess that they know God, but in their works they do what? They deny. If a woman <coughs> rebels against God and she refuses to do this, she can profess one thing about Jesus Christ, but in her actions she is denying the very God that she says that she professes. Homemaking is made up of a lot of things. And there's nothing menial about it. Cooking and cleaning and washing and ironing, folding clothes, sewing, shopping, budgeting. A thousand things that a woman has to do. Pay bills, know how to shop, know something about the economy. She's basically an engineer. She's a domestic engineer. Colleges... Today is a waste of time, and it's a waste of money. <clears throat> How many colleges do you know that teaches four years of home ec? Young lady, I told her many years ago, I said, she, family pushing her, have got to go to college. I said, find one that teaches four years of home ec if they're going to make you go. They're not out there. They'll teach you engineering. They'll teach you everything else. They'll teach you how to manage a business or be an officer in the military or whatever the case may be, but not the things that God has said. All of this is from greed and covetousness. She is to be the queen of the home. The home is her domain. That's her work. That's her business. Domestic duties. She runs the home. And we must let them do that as men and as husbands. They run that home. And they can run it very efficiently. John Wesley had even said, I heard more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians of England. I mean, you think about all the things that a mother has to do. And from the very beginning, a woman's role is defined in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3, she is called a helpmeet and he is called a provider. She is not a provider. Can I get a witness? A verbal witness. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to be again reading in verse 9. Now again, addressing the church, 
Paul to Timothy as a pastor. And he addresses the men. And we come down to verse 9. He begins addressing the women. We're not talking to the men tonight. We are, but we're not. We're mainly focusing in on keepers at home. And by the way, if men didn't want more boats and shotguns and trucks and and fishing reels and all this golf clubs and all this garbage, uh, you know, I mean, he's he's just as much guilty as she is. Because many men want that extra income. They want that extra security, have better homes and better things and more insurance and more money in the bank and all those kind of things. I mean, I know why they do it. I mean, all of us have been tempted to those kind of things. But we have to go and say, what does God want me to do? That's what Ruth and Naomi did. I want to follow their lead in the Scripture. Now notice as we begin in verse 9, and mainly what I'm after is verse 15. But let me read from verse 9. He says here in verse 9, "...in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness, sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works, let the, let the woman learn in silence and all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence." And before I go any farther, let me, let me say this. In chapter 3, he begins dealing with ministry. Chapter 3, verse 1, the office of a bishop. In chapter 3, verse 8, the office of deacons. In this same context, he's dealing with the church and ministry, bishops and deacons. They are no women ministers in the Word of God. They were no women apostles. There were no women preachers, and I'm sorry, Billy Graham made a statement one time, and he said the greatest preacher in his family was his daughter, Anne. And she tries to act like a man when she gets in the pulpit, and I'm talking, that stuff is wicked. It's contrary to, it don't matter how nice it looks and how sweet it is, it's out of hell. It's not from God. Now notice with me in verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. The context. Domestic duties in contrast to leadership duties in the home and in the church. And notice in verse 15, if you take this out of its context, think about all the doctrines you could go wrong on or maybe even start a cult. A woman is saved in childbirth. That's not talking about salvation from hell. He's talking about in the context that she shall be saved from deception because the woman was first deceived in verse 13 and 14 in the garden. And she shall be saved from usurping a man's role in the home and in the church that leadership role, because if she, if her role is domestic duties, and she's taking care of the home and having children, and other she shall be saved in childbearing, she will not have time to do otherwise. She will not have time to think about, well, I think I want to be a preacher. I want to be a general in the military. She's not going to have time For that, she's going to be in her role that God has called her to do. Notice with me as we go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, notice here. This chapter, again, is dealing with domestic duties, especially verse 14. This one verse I'm going to read sums up 
the ministry and career for women. I have an entire sermon on it. I have an entire article on this verse. In the context, beginning in verse 3 to 16, the church's responsibility to true widows and the qualifications of a widow to receive support from the church. In verse 5, she's one that trusts in God and continues in prayer. In verse 10, describes a godly woman and domestic duties. Notice in verse 10, speaking of a widow that would be qualified to be brought into the church for, uh, for financial support, it says, well reported of for good works if she have brought up children and if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the feet, the saints' feet, rather, if she have relieved the afflicted, and she have diligently followed every good work. Then he addresses the young widows in verse 11, 12, and 13. But notice one verse, one verse, verse 14. And while I'm getting ready to read this, Proverbs 31:29. The virtuous woman looketh well to the ways of her household. Proverbs 14.1 Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her, with her hands. Psalms 128 and verse 3 A wife is pictured as a fruitful vine beside the house. And this is a beautiful emblem of motherhood and shows her place of work and her dependence on her husband to protect and support her. In Proverbs 7, uh, 11, a bad woman, her feet abideth not in her house. Notice as we read in verse 14, and again, we have, we have a sermon on this, I believe it's two years ago, an article about uh, ten years ago, and it says in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. Three things. Three things. It says, I will therefore that, that the younger women marry. Second thing, bear children. The third thing is guide the house. The word guide here means to manage. Manage, to lead, to direct, to order, to influence, supervise, rule, regulate, any one of these you want to use as a conductor. The manager of house affairs, that is her business. The ministry of a wife is laid out here very clearly. In verse 14, her Main place of employment is her home, her husband, her children, taking care of that home. This is her domain. It's not whether she should work, but it is where she should work and whose authority that she should be under. This is her place of employment. Turn to Second Timothy chapter 1. I want to read this one more time as we did this morning. And notice here, the highest goal of a young woman is to make a well-ordered home. Children in order, the house in order, and again, it is not an easy thing. And if a man thinks that his wife should take on a secular job, he needs to think about that because she already has one job and he has one job. And if anybody is going to take on another job, it shouldn't be the weaker vessel. So let him take on two jobs. And let her keep her full-time job in taking care of that family in the home. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter chapter uh, 1, I'm reading in verse 5, and I read this this morning, but I'm just going to read the one verse, and this is a tribute to motherhood. And it says in verse 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Again, we see here a tribute to motherhood. We also saw this morning 
We saw in Proverbs 31, I read verse 10, verse 29, 30, and 31, the virtuous woman. Do you realize that in the 22 verses, we're going to go over those Wednesday night, in the 22 verses, it shows the woman's connection and rewards. Her connection is with her husband and with her children. It goes right back to the home. Right back to that home. And Ruth was called a virtuous woman. Can't get around this. Matthew Henry said that uh, Proverbs chapter 31 is a looking glass for ladies to dress themselves by. Write down Job 39 verses 13 through 17 mentions an ostrich, which is not as other birds, which they will protect their young, but she will abandon those eggs, and and they'll eventually many times be trampled on, talking about the foolishness and lack of wisdom of the ostrich, and in ancient times, the ostrich was a symbol of maternal neglect. Do we not see that today in our society? Now, I want us to turn, I told you, I'm not going to keep it long. I want us to turn to Hebrews 11. I'm going to close here as we did this morning. And we're going to look at the subject of a virtuous woman Wednesday night. We're going to spend a few weeks before we get back into a book study. Uh, I want to preach a message the following week on praying in the Spirit. But notice as we come to Hebrews chapter 11... And basically, I'm going to read one verse from this chapter. Yeah, again, I've read some articles that talks about our economy, even the prices of houses and automobiles is, is, is pretty much uh, built around two-income family. Pretty amazing to think about. Uh, in this article, it said, just look at the price of things. And they, they went about to prove it. I never did totally understand everything they were saying, but they were trying to prove that. Look at the daycare industry. Read my article. Listen to my sermon we did eight years ago in 2010. I just went through a ton of scriptures and and, uh, and, and stats on that. It's absolutely phenomenal that one of the fastest growing industries in our country. Public schools today are training boys and girls the same way. And when they graduate, they both know how to do exactly the same job. That's contrary to Scripture. It's contrary to Scripture. We're not against education. I've been educating myself, you know, for 65 years. Not against education. We're against where you're going to get it and what kind it is. I hear people talk about going to college and say, well, you know, 80% of it is garbage and Greek philosophy and all this garbage. I said, I wouldn't be there. Well, I can't get a degree if I don't go there. I say, well, I don't need a degree. I need education. I need to know. But I don't need this garbage. And this is what colleges are doing. I said that four years of college is a waste of time for most people. And it's also a waste of money. It's nothing to spend a hundred thousand dollars in four years and uh, with college. I realize there's some things we've got to be trained in, and I do not believe in the Mister Mom theology that we hear of today in in our society. There's no such thing. The family is the basic foundation of our society, and we see the family crumbling. And so is our society, our nation, our churches. You don't know how many people's got up and walked off from this church over the last 28 years. Matter of fact, this church is exactly 28 years old this evening at 6 o'clock. The 13th of May 1990 is when we formed this church in a community center off of Fowl River. You'd be surprised that people have come through here and over a subject that we're talking about tonight, people get up and walk out and never come back again. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, Satan's attack. He attacked 
the home, the first home. And he went after the woman to cause her to become discontent with her gift, her calling, and to despise her role. Offered her wisdom. And let me tell you something. We need wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that their eyes were opened unto. Feminism denies the biblical position that a woman was created for. And Christianity exalts the biblical position she was created for as I spoke to you this morning. Again, don't put the weaker vessel, First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, out there working two jobs, one in the home and one in the corporate world, when the man only has one job. Let the man take a second job. And let me say this, for the sake of myself and you men or other men that will listen to this tape, many times in families it's his and hers. How many of you have ever heard that garbage? Let me tell you what it is. It's ours. If you marry a woman and you ask her to be a homemaker, that woman is working full time. As a matter of fact, she's putting in more hours than we are. And don't ever say, this is my money and my automobile and my house and my land and this is my gas and this is my... my." No, it's ours. You're working and she's working and you have become heirs together for the kingdom of God. It's ours. It's not his and hers. I get so sick of hearing that kind of stuff. A woman becomes a domestic engineer. Don't you like that title? A domestic engineer. She becomes an educator. She is a nurse. She's a chef. She is a counselor. She is a teacher and professor. She is a psychologist. She's got to learn economics. All of these things, and you could add another hundred words uh, to this list. The importance of that mother, that wife that's in the home, that is running that home. She's a manager of that home. And she can either make it right or either she can destroy it. Let me close this evening with Hebrews chapter 11. I did a little study and I don't remember all the details of it a number of years ago. But when we, we look at our society and compare it with Scriptures, it's almost like this truth has been bred out of women. I read a story about chickens and raised in incubators and all those things and, and no motherly instinct. I, I don't even know where all that's true or not, but I read this article years ago. And, uh, and it's almost like in our society, those that are raised in daycare and those that are raised in the public school system and then raised in the secular universities and colleges, whatever. It's almost like we have been robbed of something that God has put down deep in our soul. What we need to do, what the roles that God has given to us, whether it be a man or a woman, is that we need to cultivate a love and desire for the truth of God's Word, no matter what the world says. And we need to give ourselves holy sisters, young ladies, aged women. We need to give ourselves holy to domestic affairs. Period. That needs to be our vocation. That needs to be our calling. That needs to be the thing that dominates our hearts and minds. I've heard women say, well, I just don't like to do housework. I'd rather be outside. Learn to do it. Love it. Cultivate it. Pray to God to give you... Uh, I've seen women, I don't like to cook. I don't, uh, you know, I don't care anything about it. I'd rather be out, you know, uh, running a tractor. Well, learn how to do it. And cultivate this in your heart. Because this is God's will and God's Word. Remember, the angels are watching 1 Corinthians 11.10. 
Remember that we will all give an account unto God one day. Romans 14.10 And remember that our works do follow us into eternity, even in resurrection, in Revelation 14, verses 12 and in verse 13. It doesn't matter if everybody in this city goes against God. What are we going to do? It doesn't matter if every church goes into apostasy. What are we going to do? It doesn't. My wife and I were talking today. It doesn't matter. Our families. I said. I said uh, we need to be a stay in our families. I said, if not, who else is going to do it? Somebody needs to be standing when others are not standing. Let us not sell our birthright for pottage for a bowl of soup. Something that tastes good temporarily and then something that is lost forever. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. It says this, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently, help me with the last two words, seek Him. Those that diligently, that is constantly an effort, seek Him. Let us be Christ followers, Bible believers, and seekers of God. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee this evening for Thy love and for Thy Word and Thy truth. And Lord, we pray tonight that we would meditate upon these Scripture and we would believe them. And Lord, that we would teach them to others. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.